Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Alex Neve on human rights governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week, I'm happy to welcome into our studio here at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario, some noted expert on some area of international politics, uh, global governance. And this week, I'm very happy to welcome Alex Neve, Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada, one of the world's premier human rights uh, civil society organizations. And for the benefit of our, our audience who may not know too much about Amnesty, uh, perhaps we could start with you filling us in on the background of where Amnesty came from, uh, how it grew and developed, and uh, what the lay of the land is now as an organization. Uh, well, Amnesty International is the world's largest human rights organization, and our beginnings go back to 1961 when a British lawyer heard about a case of injustice in Portugal to students who had been wrongfully arrested during a time of very cruel military government in Portugal uh, and had been imprisoned and, uh, and badly treated and was determined to find a way for ordinary people around the world to join their voices up in protesting cases of that sort and demanding that the abuses come to an end and that the, the violations cease. And, uh, and Amnesty was born on that premise, the notion that together the power of our voices can bring an end to injustice, that uh, individuals, governments that do violate human rights can be made to change their ways. And for 51 years now, Amnesty members around the world have been taking up individual cases or wider cases of concern, or they've been pushing for policy reforms. Uh, all with the main goal of upholding international human rights standards. That may include calling for the release of prisoners of conscience. It may mean working to end torture somewhere. Uh, more recently, a lot of our work has moved into um, uh, broader human rights concerns. We do a lot of work to try to bring violence against women to an end, to uphold uh, rights to adequate housing and other economic, social and cultural rights. All of that we, we do through a whole variety of different techniques. We still do where we began, which is a lot of letter writing. Mm -hmm. People will write to the president or the, the governor of a state or the warden of a prison uh, outlining their concerns about a case and, and demanding change. But also, obviously, in today's world, we use a lot of uh, more modern techniques. We're very active on the internet, Facebook, Twitter. And we're very public. Uh, Amnesty members do things out in the street. Uh, they do things in their local schools, in shopping malls. They do media interviews. They try to talk about these issues with people in their communities. Mm -hmm. Now, you're the Secretary General of Amnesty Canada. How does that relate to other chapters of the organization globally? Well, over these 51 years, Amnesty truly has grown uh, to be a global organization. And, uh, and that's fundamental to our power and our success. The fact that we, when we speak on an issue, can truly say we speak from all corners of the world obviously brings greater power and influence to our voice. Uh, here in Canada, we have 80,000 members in two branches. There's an English branch and a Francophone branch of Amnesty here in Canada. We're very closely connected, but we are independent of each other. Uh, and we stand alongside some 60 plus other formal national sections of Amnesty around the world, and then all sorts of other less formal and developing structures in other countries. Uh, and we're all very closely connected. We work under the same global vision. We, every few years, set major global priorities of what, as a worldwide movement, we will focus on as our key priorities. Obviously, when it comes down to the work that is done within any particular country, uh, that differs uh, depending on the country concerned. Uh, here in Canada, in addition to our global work, we do a lot of work on human rights issues within Canada. Um, other parts of, of Amnesty around the world may not do as much on Canada as we do, although they would take up some of that work as well. We also, in terms of our international priorities, would set priorities for action here in Canada based on countries, for instance, that we think the Canadian government maybe has particular influence with, or countries that have a sizable expatriate community here in Canada, or or simply countries that we know Canadians will care about and are more likely to take action when we ask them to do. So that means that some of the focus differs a bit from country to country, 
but it all stands together as one coherent package of amnesty all around the world working for universal human rights protection. Mm -hmm. Now you said that Amnesty is the world's largest human rights organization. There are others and some are household names also such as Human Rights Watch. How does Amnesty relate to those, uh, if at all? Are there formal or informal uh, cooperative ventures, uh, close liaison, or do they operate more or less independently? Uh, I would say it's both, actually. There certainly is a lot of independence, and, uh, but there is also a lot of coordination and close connection. Uh, at the global level with groups like Human Rights Watch, we often work uh, shoulder to shoulder with, with Human Rights Watch or the International Federation of Human Rights and other uh, major organizations. Uh, we'll do things jointly, we'll issue joint reports, we'll do press work jointly, we'll launch initiatives at the United Nations together. Uh, and, uh, and we try to do so on a strategic basis, picking times and issues where we really think that joining our forces together makes a difference. Other times, we quite intentionally don't join up. Sometimes it's actually more powerful to have the message being conveyed different times separately and not only once in unison. Uh, or there may be other times when organizations simply have a different take or a different perspective on an issue and, and therefore it's best to express that separately. That's at sort of the big global level, but what I would really stress is perhaps even more importantly is the kind of close connection and partnership we have with human rights organizations on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, I'm back recently from a, a mission in Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa, for instance, and throughout that mission, a key part of what we were doing was hooking up with a remarkable array of very courageous and talented human rights activists uh, there in Cote d'Ivoire, some of whom are members of national organizations and are therefore a bit more organized. Others were simply on the ground, in their community, grassroots activists who are, who are maybe in the stage of struggling to set up a two or three person little human rights organization in their neighborhood. And those partnerships are so important. Right. They're valuable sources of information, but, but ultimately, of course, that's, that's really the best future for human rights protection anywhere, is, is when we see at the grassroots human rights activism so deeply entrenched like that, that's what gives the best promise mm. for a future in which rights are protected. So we spend a lot of energy and give a lot of attention to really nurturing those relationships. And most of the time, the targets of Amnesty's uh, activities are really governments. They attempt to get governments to change their behavior. I imagine that the governments that don't behave well don't particularly like Amnesty. <laughs> but how are relations with, with relatively well-behaved governments in, in developed wealthy countries? Uh, well, it's, uh, that's an interesting question because uh, I think especially over the last decade we've had, um, we've had sort of a different global context in which a lot of our work has played out in that we have found ourselves, particularly because a lot of the human rights violations that arose in the context of the war on terror, uh, turning our attention very deliberately uh, and, uh, and with grave, grave concern to the actions mm -hmm. of governments which have traditionally been thought of as the leaders, the champions, uh, the, the governments that in decades past were the ones at the United Nations pushing for stronger laws against torture, etc., were now the very governments that we were criticizing for eroding those standards and violating those standards. Uh, so that's, that's put us in a, in a somewhat different context, I think, over the last decade. It's meant that sometimes the relationships with those governments have been a bit more strained uh, than they have in the past. Uh, but it's been very important, and, and the fact that Amnesty always maintains independence from governments. We never take government funding, for instance, from any government anywhere. Uh, with respect to our research work uh, has been very important here because it's meant that when we need it to be very critical of those governments, there was nothing standing in the way. And, uh, and I think as a result, our voice has been a very strong one over the last decade around this grave concern that key fundamental human rights safeguards were being eroded in the context of the war on terror. Mm, fascinating. Well, we'll be back in a moment with Alex Neve. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So Alex, one of the most interesting exchanges I ever observed on human rights was in a conference hall in Havana, uh, one of the uh, anniversary uh, conferences we held on the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And in the room were uh, Robert McNamara, former Secretary of Defense, and Fidel Castro, and they had an interesting back and forth in which Bob McNamara uh, lambasted Cuba for not respecting 
voices of political opposition and for jailing dissidents and so forth and so on and not respecting human rights. And Fidel Castro immediately shot back that uh, he wished the United States would, you know, respect uh, basic public health needs, provide health care for all their citizens. Nicely illustrated the difference between what we call sort of political and civil human rights on the one hand and social and economic rights on the other. Amnesty began, as I understand it, focused on the former. It was about political and civil rights and recently has begun also, as you mentioned a moment ago, to take on uh, causes having to do with social and economic rights. Why did that happen and when did that happen and what has been the result for Amnesty and its work? Mm -hmm. Well, our, our sort of jour the journey of our human rights mission has been a constant evolution really going back to 1961, the very beginning, because at the very beginning, uh, yes, I mean, the work we did was in the civil and political rights realm, but it was actually on a very specific issue. It was the issue of prisoners of conscience. Uh, and it was with time as the years went past that we started to move into other civil and political rights work. Uh, and then as we became a large organization and uh, you know, we're having healthy debates about our capacity, our responsibilities, uh, what was the most effective and principled way to approach our human rights work, it just became very clear to us that we'd reached a stage where we truly had to take on the entirety of what is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for instance, which doesn't draw distinctions between civil and political rights being more important or more significant than economic, social, and cultural rights. They're all there in the Declaration. The right to be free from torture, rights associated with education, rights to freedom of expression, rights around health care and adequate housing. They all stand equally there in the Declaration. Uh, and so we'd reached a stage where we truly felt it was time for us to embrace a program of human rights work uh, that, that mirrored the Declaration. Not to suggest that we would ever be able to be working on all rights in all countries at, at all times. We simply would never have the capacity to do so. So it means we always have to make choices, set priorities. Um, but it's also given us the ability, and I think this is one of the very powerful reasons why it was important for us to make this move, to start to take on human rights situations in a much more interconnected way, to recognize the ways in which various kinds of human rights violations are intertwined. They're not separate stories. Uh, and to show how uh, violations of one particular right lead to and are compounded by uh, violations of other rights, etc. And that really gives us, I think, a much more powerful ability to set the kind of agenda for reform and change that needs to be at the at the center of our advocacy. The change happened um, about 10 years ago. Uh, it had been after a long and very healthy debate within Amnesty. These kinds of changes around our mission and our policies uh, happen from the grassroots all the way up. They're not decisions that are made by senior leaders off at our international office in London or or even at my level here in Ottawa. They begin with members having these discussions at their local amnesty chapter here somewhere in Canada or in uh, Chile or in Sweden or wherever the case may be. Uh, and then those ideas percolate up to national level and then they come off to international meetings. And, and the debate uh, was, was a good one. On one hand, there were people who said, look, uh, the issues we've been working on are still of pressing concern. We haven't eradicated torture. Prisoners of conscience are still being detained. Uh, shouldn't we stay focused? Well, on the other hand, all the reasons I just described for why it was time for us to embrace a, a wider vision uh, and be much more interconnected in how we do our human rights work uh, was also being pressed. Uh, and that's what has prevailed. And I think over the last decade, we've started to move into that in a, in a very powerful way. I think there's still far for us to go in terms of, of uh, sort of the range and nature of how we do work in these new areas, but it's absolutely the right, the right uh, course for us to chart. And was any part of that evolution a function of a sense that although the civil and political rights issues were still alive, people were still being jailed and tortured and so on, there was progress on that file? And so there was room to expand the range of issues? Uh, I think that's probably a fair assessment, uh, at least in the sense of that there was progress in that those rights, the civil and political rights realm, were for the most part well recognized as rights. The violations were still happening, uh, but... But at a lower level at all? Uh, um, I think that would fluctuate over time, uh, but uh, uh, I think there was sort of clear recognition that, for instance, something like the prohibition against torture, 
Amnesty had been central for several decades to the work to really get that enshrined in international law, to get a specific treaty at the United Nations uh, dealing with torture, and to really reach a stage where we'd taken away from any government the ability to somehow argue that torture was okay or that torture, you know, the prohibition against torture wasn't really a firm right. Uh, we had clearly enshrined it in law. There was a lot of work still to be done to make sure that governments were living up to that. Uh, whereas on the economic, social, and cultural rights side, uh, we're, we were still faced and are still faced today with governments always uh, putting forward, and the Canadian government does this as well, a view that, well, they're lesser rights, they're weaker rights, uh, uh, we don't really take them as seriously, we can't take them to court, they're not enforceable in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that there's, there's a real need as a human rights organization to get in that fight uh, right. and, and make sure that it's made very clear to governments that they can't get away with that anymore, that it's time to, to clearly acknowledge uh, that that other realm of rights is as equal as all other rights and must be protected. Very good. We'll be back again in a moment with Alex Nee. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So let's talk about some of the issues that you're grappling with now. You mentioned that uh, in the wake of the war on terror, Amnesty had turned its attention to some of the previously well-behaved countries. Uh, is that particular issue dealt with, do you think? Do you think you've sort of won the battle uh, against the kinds of behaviors we witnessed in the immediate aftermath of the war on terror? If not, how far can we expect this battle to continue? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think some of the worst excesses we saw uh, in the war on terror have, have started to subside, but by no means is that a closed chapter. Guantanamo Bay is still open, for one thing. We've recently seen uh, Canadian citizen Omar Khadr finally released from Guantanamo and now back in a Canadian prison, but there are uh, over 120 prisoners still being held there. President Obama's famous uh, post-inauguration promise that Guantanamo was going to be closed within a year has long passed and uh, and there's no indication that that's anywhere near uh, going to be complied with. Uh, so there's... Why not? Why, why is that uh, being, not being complied with? Well, I, I guess we need him here to, to answer that. I think, th I think the, the clearest assessment is that he uh, faced considerable opposition from Congress uh, and recognized that it was going to be an incredible fight. Uh, to get that through and made a political decision that it was a fight that he wasn't prepared to take on, that he didn't want to uh, expend political capital on that as opposed to other issues he had to deal with and, and let it go. Uh, and that's unfortunate because I think the, the sort of the vision and the leadership we heard from him uh, when he made the promise was the right one. Uh, he knew why it was so important for that to be one of the first promises he made uh, right after inauguration, why that was going to be something he moved on very quickly, that, that yes, it was about bringing that particular human rights concern to an end and, and upholding the, the human rights of the, uh, the, the dozens and dozens of people who were still held there, but that there was a much greater global and national significance uh, to that, that Guantanamo was something, because of its iconic status really, uh, that stood in so many ways for the ways that human rights more widely were being eroded in the war on terror, and that it was time to to staunch that uh, wound and really bring this all to an end. And it's unfortunate that that hasn't mm. happened. So, Are prisoners so in Guantanamo better treated today than they were under the previous president? Uh, there, there have been some improvements at, at Guantanamo. There was some, some tweaking of the, the military commission process, um, arguably making some aspects of it a bit fairer, but the bottom line is everything about Guantanamo's very existence. Uh, the military commission proceedings that are being used to bring some of the prisoners to trial, and the fact that there's countless others who simply remain there without any prospect of ever being brought to trial, all of those concerns fall far, far short of international human rights mm -hmm. standards. And how's the Canadian government doing? Uh, we've, we've got a lot of challenges right now. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of areas where, uh, where Canada has, has been falling short, both globally and domestically, uh, with our human rights record. Uh, and the human rights positions we've taken uh, around a number of issues. Uh, at international level, I think it's been a disappointing several years. We, uh, 
Uh, we had the aggressive oppositional stance Canada took to adoption of the UN's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a long overdue and sorely needed international human rights instrument to respond to one of the world's gravest human rights challenges. Canada, given our own challenges and needs around the rights of Indigenous peoples here in Canada, should have been leading the charge on that file. We should have been an absolute champion. Uh, and to see the aggressive opposition that Canada took to try to see it defeated instead uh, was stunning and very disappointing. We didn't succeed, fortunately. The declaration exists. It was overwhelmingly supported by the rest of the world, and Canada finally gave in and has said we support it as well. Uh, but that's been of grave concern. Um, Canada has, um, has also been ambivalent as of late on the global level with respect to the death penalty, an issue where, again, we should be absolutely firm. We abolished the death penalty years ago. There hasn't been an execution in Canada for 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and there's some important work happening at the UN right now to try to really cement abolition of the death penalty around the world with uh, uh, a resolution that comes before the UN General Assembly every two years calling for a moratorium. Uh, on executions. Well, Canada votes in favor of that resolution, but we're the only firmly abolitionist country in the world that won't go a step further and show leadership by co-sponsoring the resolution. That may not sound like a big deal uh, to people. We vote for it. Isn't that what really matters? Well, of course that is important. But when we're talking about an issue where we really want to see progress, an issue where the work is difficult and where there's still some real struggles ahead, we need leaders. Uh, and to see Canada which has traditionally been a global leader on this particular file, deliberately step back from leadership has been very disappointing and has been noted uh, by many other governments. Uh, so, I mean, that's just two issues, there's a whole host of others, but um, our, our record and our reputation on the world stage when it comes to human rights is not what it has been mm. in the past. Yeah, well, that's very sad. We'll be back in a moment with Alex Neve one more time. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So Canada, the United States, these are countries where amnesty can operate um, safely, openly, with a lot of popular buy-in. Governments may not like it, but they have no choice but to listen. I imagine that some of the real human rights hotspots in the world are places where it's very difficult for Amnesty to operate or any human rights organization to operate. Where are some of the real hotspots now and which countries would you really like to see um, change their behavior on the human rights file? Uh, well, there are a number of countries where it's very hard for us to operate in any way. Uh, certainly there are countries where it's difficult for us to uh, even be on the ground to do human rights research, let alone think about something longer term like having an office there and starting to develop a national section and, and having lots of visible activism and campaigning happening within the country. Uh, there are some countries that have never allowed Amnesty internationally, and China uh, is, is one very good example. Uh, we have never been allowed into China uh, to do on the ground human rights research. We do an immense amount of research and campaigning on China nonetheless. Uh, but our sources and the way we gather the information has to be by means other than being on the ground. Is that um, so that's local people being very brave and sort of quietly providing information? A whole host of different sources. Um, certainly all sorts of local contacts, people who have been able to leave the country, but they themselves are maintaining close connections with people back in China. Uh, diplomats, journalists, there's all sorts of sources. And of course in today's world, even though China does the best it can to constantly crack down on use of the internet, there are a whole host of new tools and techniques available to, to people who do want to get information uh, out of a country. Now we constantly have to assess that information to determine when it's credible and when it's not and we corroborate one source against another, etc. But, mm -hmm. but China, in answer to your question, I think China would be a very obvious example of a country where um, our aspiration is to have a much more solid presence in China, both with respect to the ability to be on the ground doing research throughout China uh, as it needs to happen, but also to actually have a permanent amnesty presence mm. there of some kind, to have um, that kind of human rights activism and campaigning, which would both have a focus on concerns within China, but also would be an opportunity for people across China to be using their voices and speaking out about human rights concerns around the world uh, and trying to influence Chinese foreign policy with respect to human rights concerns around the world, all of that we would ultimately 
like to see very much. There's a, there's a very inspiring and very brave nascent human rights community within China. There's some very courageous human rights lawyers and activists uh, who are starting to really use human rights language and arguments and laws and international norms and treaties in the ways in which they try to bring up issues uh, within their communities. Uh, they have suffered a great deal for that. Many of those activists have been, uh, have been arrested, have been tortured, have been subject to unfair trials, and, and really are paying a price for trying to speak out for human rights. Uh, we need to move through and past that, and countries like Canada should be making it very clear to China uh, that that's unacceptable, uh, that human rights activism, uh, and I'm not just talking about the need to have Amnesty International in China and, and doing work, I'm talking about human rights activism in a broader sense, uh, needs to be not, uh, not vilified or punished, but actually celebrated and supported, and that that's the direction we need to see China move in. Mm -hmm. Now, two countries that are dominating the headlines these days are Syria and Iran. I imagine these are both countries where Amnesty would have a great, great deal of interest in having more of an impact. Is there room for a civil society organization such as Amnesty to, to play a role in the development of events either in Syria or Iran, or are these just issues that are seized by the great powers and, and being dealt with by governments uh, through the traditional old-fashioned tools of international politics. I think there's a central role, and I think with both of those countries, it's important to first highlight that, of course, Amnesty was there uh, long before the countries captured the headlines recently. Uh, Amnesty's work on Syria and Iran goes back decades and decades, and, and with both of those countries goes back to times when the great world powers were willing to kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, turn a blind eye to abuses happening in those countries, or even, and with respect to Syria in the context of the recent war on terror, sometimes go nudge, nudge, wink, wink, hey, why don't we benefit? Uh, you know, Syria was one of the countries that was used by other governments to send people off through extraordinary rendition. Canadian citizens uh, were, um, you know, their, their imprisonment and torture uh, in Syria, to put it mildly at the very least, was tolerated uh, by Canadian security agencies. That's only a few years ago. Uh, so, uh, so I think one of the key roles that Amnesty brings when, when crises have erupted in countries like Syria and Iran is that long-term view. We've always been there. We have the connections. Therefore, the kind of analysis we can bring to events as they're unfolding, I think, is very solid and it's more rooted in history, perhaps. Uh, but I think it's also really important that in the midst of situations like the Syria and Iranian situations, which, which do inherently become very politicized, uh, there is a need on the world stage for a voice like Amnesty's that isn't coming from a political perspective. We're not taking sides around who should or should not be the government in any particular gov country or, or what kind of government it should be. We just have a very strong critique that we put forward around here's the human rights violations that are happening, here's why they're happening, and here's what needs to change. Mm. Uh, and that's a very important part of that debate. Right. Now, if you could improve global human rights governance in one way, what would you do? What's What's the single most needed change in either the array of actors involved in human rights governance or in the legal tools available to, to uh, combat human rights violations or, or the structure of the institutions that are involved on human rights issues? What would you do if you had a magic wand and could wave it? <laughs> and I only get one choice. One choice. Uh, well, I, I feel torn. I mean, in a broad sense, uh, what we so desperately need is to see reforms right across the international system that focus on enforcement. Uh, we have, for decades and decades, been developing all sorts of norms and principles and treaties and declarations. Uh, we could fill this room easily with all the beautiful world, words that, uh, that governments have put down on paper and the great promises they've made, and that continues to happen. And it's important, uh, but there has never been enough political will devoted to the key question of, okay, we've made the promises, now how are we gonna hold ourselves to those promises? And, uh, and that is where we need to see real changes. It includes at bodies like the Security Council. I mean, the Syria crisis is a perfect example of the ways in which, when it comes to enforcing uh, human rights protection, that body can become completely dysfunctional when it's most needed. Uh, I do a lot of work within Amnesty with respect to the crisis that's been unfolding in Sudan and South Sudan as well, and it too has been hostage to a lot of Security Council politics. Uh, so it's, it's at that level, but it's also at, at just simple practical levels right through the UN uh, human rights system of, of 
taking steps to ensure that the, the committees that are in charge of supervising the implementation of the key UN human rights treaties have the resources they need, have the powers they need uh, to actually hold governments uh, to what they've promised to do, that, that the experts that get appointed by bodies like the UN Human Rights Council to, to travel the world and carry out investigations into a whole range of particular human rights concerns uh, are, uh, are given the kind of power and stature they need to really push their agendas forward. That's what we need to see happen. We need to see much stronger commitment within the system and reforms to back it up. Uh, that, that make it clear that when it comes to human rights, they're not just about promises, they are about enforcement. Mm. Do you think we'll see the day when, uh, inter when uh, universal jurisdiction really takes hold, when international tribunals are able to operate in a far less constrained way than today? Uh, I think the whole journey around, for instance, something like the International Criminal Court has to be seen as a long-term project. Um, it was obviously immensely exciting the, the few years after 1998 to realize that we, we had sort of won the big battle and we were going to create the court and suddenly uh, states were signing on and the court existed and even the first cases were starting to happen. Uh, but I think all along most observers have known that, uh, that that's going to take many, mm. many years to play out uh, to reach a stage where that court has the kind of resourcing and political support uh, that it needs to be able to do its work well, that it's able to get the kind of cooperation from governments right around the world, for instance, to make sure that the people it wants to see arrested are actually arrested, President Bashir of Sudan being a perfect oh. example, that we will eventually, I think, reach a day where, where governments aren't willing to simply let an indicted war criminal like that uh, come visiting whenever he wants to and realize that they're actually their primary obligation is to the world at large and it's to carry out that arrest warrant. But that's not going to happen next month. Well, we'll uh, that's patient, a long-term change. But there is progress, clearly. I think there yeah. absolutely is progress. Very good. Well, thank you so much for coming in and speaking to us today and to our audience. Thank you for joining us and join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. To the president or the, the governor of a state or the warden of a prison uh, outlining their concerns about a case and, and demanding change. But also, obviously, in today's world, we use a lot of uh, more modern techniques. We're very active on the internet, Facebook, Twitter, and we're very public. Uh, Amnesty members do things out in the street. Uh, they do things in their local schools, in shopping malls. They do media interviews. They try to talk about these issues with people in their communities. Mm -hmm. Now, you're the Secretary General of Amnesty Canada. How does that relate to other chapters of the organization globally? Well, over these 51 years, Amnesty truly has grown uh, to be a global organization, and, uh, and that's fundamental to our power and our success. The fact that we, when we speak on an issue, can truly say we speak from all corners of the world obviously brings greater power and influence to our voice. Uh, here in Canada, we have 80,000. Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Alex Neve on human rights governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week I'm happy to welcome into our studio here at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario, some noted expert on some area of international politics, uh, global governance, and this week I'm very happy to welcome Alex Neve, Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada, one of the world's premier human rights uh, civil society organizations. Members in two branches, there's an English branch and a Francophone branch of Amnesty here in Canada. We're very closely connected, but we are independent of each other. Uh, and we stand alongside some 60 plus other formal national sections of Amnesty around the world and then all sorts of other less formal and developing structures in other countries. Uh, and we're all very closely connected. We work under the same global vision. We, every few years, set major global priorities of what, as a worldwide movement, we will focus on as our key priorities. Uh, 
Obviously, when it comes down to the work that is done within any particular country, uh, that differs uh, depending on the country concerned. Uh, here in Canada, in addition to our global work, we do a lot of work on human rights issues within Canada. Um, other parts of, of Amnesty around the world may not do as much on Canada as we do, although they would take up some of that work as well. We also, in terms of our international priorities, would set priorities for action here and of our voices can bring an end to injustice that uh, individuals, governments that do violate human rights can be made to change their ways. And for 51 years now, Amnesty members around the world have been taking up individual cases or wider cases of concern or they've been pushing for policy reforms. Uh, all with the main goal of upholding international human rights standards. That may include calling for the release of prisoners of conscience. It may mean working to end torture somewhere. Uh, more recently, a lot of our work has moved into um, uh, broader human rights concerns. We do a lot of work to try to bring violence against women to an end, to uphold uh, rights to adequate housing and other economic, social and cultural rights. All of that we, we do through a whole variety of different techniques. We still do where we began, which is a lot of letter writing. Mm -hmm. People will write. And for the benefit of our, our audience who may not know too much about Amnesty, uh, perhaps we could start with you filling us in on the background of where Amnesty came from, uh, how it grew and developed, and uh, what the lay of the land is now as an organization. Uh, well, Amnesty International is the world's largest human rights organization and our beginnings go back to 1961 when a British lawyer heard about a case of injustice in Portugal to students who had been wrongfully arrested during a time of very cruel military government in Portugal uh, and had been imprisoned and, uh, and badly treated and was determined to find a way for ordinary people around the world to join their voices up in protesting cases of that sort and demanding that the abuses come to an end and that the, the violations cease. And, uh, and Amnesty was born on that premise, the notion that together the power